Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Thank you all for coming to today's Oxford Interface Forum, the Manuscripts and Interface Context Session. It gives me great, great pleasure to introduce the amazing scholar, Dr. Martina Mampieri. It's a current Martin Buber Fellow and Lecturer in, of Jewish History at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He earned a double PhD, which is remarkable, in both in history and Jewish studies from the University of Roma and, and the University of Hamburg in 2017. 2018 through 20, she held uh, postdoctoral positions at Harvard University, the University of Göttingen, and, and the Institut de Recherche in, in Paris. She's the author of Living Under the Evil Popes, the Hebrew Chronicle of Pope Paul IV by, ben, by Benjamin and, uh, Nehemiah Ben El Natan from the 16th century, which was published in, by Brill in 2020. She's also published a, a collection of uh, articles and books on, on the Jew, and articles on Jewish cultural and religious history in early modern and, and modern periods. And she's currently working on her second project, which is a cultural biography of Isaiah Zona in the, in, and his passion for books. And I'm looking forward to seeing that when it comes out in print. Martina, the table is all yours. Thank you very much, Chaim. Um, really, thank you for the introduction and thank you, Thea, for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here with you. Thank you all for attending the lecture. Um, so now I'm going to share my screen. Thank you again for attending the lecture. It gives me great pleasure because it's also an occasion for me to go back to my PhD thesis and my first book, uh, which was published in 2020. Um, so the, the topic of this lecture is about uh, is the, pope, the history of popes in the 16th century Italy through the chronicle of Pope Paul IV. But before diving into um, what the, top, the real topic of the lecture is, I just want to briefly uh, go back to um, how Jews wrote about popes and how, what does it mean? What did it mean for Jews writing about non-Jewish history? So um, I will start. The history of the relations between the Jews and the popes is a long one, a millennial one. Uh, as it is well known, the Jewish presence in Rome and then the remainder of the Papal States dates back before the Christian era and has continued through the centuries until the present, until the present day. Jews lived under the popes. Sometimes they were employed as physicians and artists at their courts where they interacted with them. Late medieval and early modern Jewish authors often described the new Jewish society they lived in, in lingering on their relations with the political authorities, whether they were kings, sultans, princes, city councils, and so on. This is the case, for example, of Yosef Akoin, Divrei Amim Le Malkei Sarfat, Umalkebet Ottoman Togar, so Easter, the history of the kings of France and the Ottoman kings, but also the Sedere Eliyahu Zuta, an elaborate account of the Ottoman Empire, which includes both a history of Turkish and Spanish Jewry, and Sipuri Venezia, both works by Eliyahu Kapstali. As the popes detained both political and religious power in the Catholic world, mentions or stories about them are also to be found in Jewish medieval and early modern works. Now the question is, how did Jews talk about the popes? And how did they refer to them? Let's look at the term they use first. So while Christians authors adopted the, ter the term pontifex from the highest religious authority in ancient Rome, or in the Roman religion, the Aramaic term that Jewish authors use for Pope is afifior or apifior. The origin and the etymology of this word are reasons of, for debate among linguists today. The title in fact appears only once in the Talmud in Avodah Zaram, in the story of, of Onkelos, a Roman who converted to Judaism and, a nephew, and the nephew of the Emperor Hadrian. In his speech, Onkelos refers to the Afifior, not to the Catholic Pope, but as a dignitary or a high official, not really a religious authority. According to some other scholars, the origin of the Aramaic term must have come from the Greek papias, which can mean either a torchbearer or a conductor, a guide, and other Hebrew linguists affirm that afifior comes from another Greek word, which, which is epiphoros, since epiphero and phoros mean carrier, so a bearer. Other people, other scholars claim that the term comes actually from the Hebrew avi, father, and pior, 
referring to Peter, the first pope. Or other scholars again claim that the word come from the Greek, comes from the Greek Papa Yeros, from Holy Father. So now we don't hand turn to the deep into the linguistic debates um, because it's really not the topic of this lecture and we don't have the time. But it is safe to assume that by the Middle Ages, Jews commonly refer to popes with the term apifiorim, apifior. Um, so for example, in the Sefer Yosipon, um, a medieval chronicle, uh, the author refers to the apifior as the greatest bishop governing over all bishops. So a Roman Catholic pope. And while Eliao Kapsali again used the term in an ambiguous way, um, both for um, a high uh, official, uh, religious official, like the Catholic Pope, or, um, or the emperor, like uh, a civil authority. But how Jews describe the popes, the Apifiorim, in their own words? How did Jews really talk about the popes? And for what reason? Why it was so important talking about popes? Again, I, we, I don't have the time to, to go into um, an elaborate analysis and discussion of, of what medieval and early modern authors wrote. So I would just pick an, a remarkable example of um, Abraham Zakuto Sefer Hassin. So in the sixth and last part, in the sixth and last part of Sefer Hassin, the book of genealogies, the Spanish astronomer and astrologer Abraham Zakuto provides a chronology of the world from the creation to the year 1503, combining Jewish events with non-Jewish history. Now, albeit brief, the, the descriptions shed light on the degree of knowledge a Jewish author who had been expelled twice from Castile and Portugal and then captured by the pirates in the Mediterranean could have in the late 15th century. He mentions briefly Peter as the first Pope uh, also, Pope Sylvester would heal, who healed the Emperor Constantine from leprosy. And Gregory I is remembered to have composed a great book on Job, that is to say, the Moralia in Job, and for having been the teacher of Isidore of Sevilla, Archbishop of the same city, and author of the Chronica Maiora, one of Zacuto's main sources. The author refers to controversies, theological controversies schism um, among Christians, the transfer of the papacy from Rome to Avignon and then back to Rome, the general councils of the Catholic Church, Jubilee years and saints, clearly non-Jewish topics. Besides St. Francis and St. Dominic, Zacuto gives particular importance to the Valencian Dominican friar and preacher to the Jews, Vicente Ferrer, honored as a saint in 1454. 1455 after his death by Pope Calixtus III and to Simonino of Trent, a three-year-old boy whose death in 1475 was blamed on the Jewish community of Trent. After 15 Jews were then sentenced to death and burnt at the stake, the local bishop pushed for Simonino's canonization, which against Zacuto's account never took place. Only in 1584, Pope Sixtus V recognized the veneration of Simonino. As argued by Kenneth Stowe, Jews also created parables about papal powers and functions. Legends, mirabilia, and rumors also make their appearance in the Sefer du Hassin exactly with this function. Um, it is worth mentioning, for example, the description of Pope John, I quote from Zacuto, an English woman who studied philosophy in Athens. She came to Rome dressed as a man and became Pope for two years and five months. She became pregnant from her housekeeper, gave birth in the market, and she walked away from home and died. Her name was Joan or Joanna. Thus, they have the custom of grasping the testicles of a newly elected Pope to be sure it is a man." End of quote. So some sources testify that since then, indeed, all popes were subjected to the examination while sitting on this special chair, the sedia stercoraria, a dung chair with a hole through which a cardinal or a younger clerk could have checked the pope's sex before the coronation. 
like Zacuto, other 16th century Jewish authors mentioned popes and cardinals in the works. It is worth mentioning, for example, the Emek Habacha by Yosef Cohen and the Shalcheleta Kabbalah by Gedalia Ibn Archia, who both lived in the Papal States and experienced the dramatic consequences of the Cumnimis Absurdum, on which we, I will return um, in a few minutes, and the following Papal Bulls, which decreed the final expulsion of the Jews from the Papal States, with the exception of Rome, Ancona, and Avignon. Now, we go to our source. To this dark time, and in particular to the pontificate of Paul IV Carafa, which, mar which marked a turning point in the history of relations between Jews and Christians in the early modern period, is dedicated a 16th century Hebrew chronicle of Pope Paul IV, known as the Teatin, published in Hebrew for the first time in 1930 by the Galician scholar Isaiah Zone, along with a historical introduction and critical notes. In my PhD and that book, I verified the contents of the chronicle through a thorough archival search between Rome, the Vatican archives, other archives in Italy, and Israel, and the United States. Another major endeavor of my work was the first translation of the work of the text from Hebrew into English. And also following Zone's footsteps, I tried to shed some light on the story concerning the finding, Zone's finding of this extraordinary source, which was anything but clear. As he wrote, as Zone wrote himself, wrote in his introduction to uh, his 1930 edition, edition, the manuscript booklet came to his hands about a, a half a year before its publication. According to Zone's description of the manuscript that bears the title Divrea Yamim Shela Fioro Paolo Arrivia Nicra Teatino, Chronicle of Pope Paul IV, known as the Teatin, this appears, according to Zone's, uh, in Zone's, uh, Zone's words, I quote, slim and banal, about 15 folios on bluish paper in Italian course script from the beginning of the 19th century, chock full of mistakes, end of quote. And even more mysterious is the information that Zone had only one day, as he wrote in introduction, to look at the manuscript, and that for this reason he had decided to copy the manuscript in a very fast way uh, in order to observe it when needed and to check the quality of the content. We don't know where Zone uh, saw the manuscript, who allowed him to take a copy of the manuscript. We don't know. Um, well, we don't know also because Zone didn't say about the physical description, didn't say anything about the physical description of the manuscript. We don't know that the manuscript actually bears some ownership notes. And as you can see on the right hand side of the last folio, so this, this picture, um, it is possible to read in an elegant Italian and writing from the 19th century that the owner was Abraham Kalef and that the manuscript was delivered by Salomone Kalef to the rabbi of Ancona, the chief rabbi of Ancona, David Avram Vivanti, on the proviso that the latter would return it to its rightful owner, so to Abraham Kalef. And on the left, we have some just some calculations between um, the author's time and the uh, present time in Ancona. So when the Caliph family was um, living. So 1836, and we have another note from 1848. So as it has been possible to discover, thanks to an archival research between Israel and the Isaiah Zone personal archives at the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati, after Zone had seen the manuscript, so I assume August 1930, this was purchased by the German Jewish collector Sigmund Noaim, who then donated his collection of manuscripts and rare books to the National Library of Israel in 1934, exactly one year after the Nazi burning of Jewish books in Berlin. The manuscript then arrived, the collection of Sigmund Noaim arrived in Israel, in Palestine in 1937, and is still preserved there today. We don't have um, any evidence of a connection between Zone and Noaim. So my hypothesis, so what I wrote in my book and what I'm, I'm also working on, my hypothesis is that Zone tried to buy the manuscript from the person who actually sold it to Noaim. 
So Zona was probably allowed to take a look at the manuscript from, um, you know, from uh, from the the, the 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 seller, and then he copied the manuscript and he published it without any indication about the uh, physical the physical um, yeah the physical aspect of the book of the manuscript. So we still have a problem because the manuscript is not an autograph from from the 16th century so it's not uh, it's a copy from the 19th century uh we don't know um about the fate of um the 16th century original manuscript and we don't know if it still exists somewhere in the world um but we do know thanks to archival research that the chronicle of popol the fourth is not a fantasy of, of of a 19th century forger so um, we go to the author. Um, the author of the work is Benjamin Nehemia Benenatan from Civitanova Marche, also known in Italian by the name of Guglielmo di Diodato, who was um, a moneylender uh, from the second half, he probably lived between the first and the second half of the 16th century in the region of the Papal States that you can see in the, in the map in pink. Um, near Ancona. So Civitanova is exactly the point uh, under Ancona on the coast. Um, so he was a moneylender and he was an agent of uh, other moneylenders, um, Angelo Di Vitale and Michele Di Abramo. So we have all um, recorded in the notarial records that are today preserved in the market. Um, then we know that um, he had some family members, so other family members are recorded in these uh, not notarial records. Um, we know that uh, his father was Deodato di Emanuele and Nathan Ben Emanuel, uh, who was also a moneylender. And he also uh, traded um, cloth and um, garments with um, his, his sons, so both Guglielmo and Samuele. So Shmuel ben Natan. And Shmuel ben Natan, so Samuel, had also a workshop of uh, cloth, and he was probably also a weaver. Um, and he was selling garments, clothes, to the um, annual fairs in the market. So you see that the market are in a peripher peripheral um, zone area of the Papal States, where we know clearly where Rome is. So the two big centers here, in this map are Rome, Ancona, and Venice, of course. Um, and it's very important the location of Civitanova near Ancona because Ancona was a very important place and it was a city, a very important port. Um, so lots of connections and exchanges passed by Ancona. Um, so we also know that uh, from the sources, from the thanks to the archival sources in the notarial funds of the of the archive, state archives of Macerata and Civitanova, we have information about that the prominence of the family. So they were not originally of Civitanova. So the family Deodato and his children were actually from the state of Naples, from the kingdom of Naples. So you can see in the south is exactly the part in uh, behind, I mean under the Papal States. Um, and there is a place like a, a, this blue dot called Cellino was actually the, the originary place of the family. So in 1541, because of the decree of expulsion of the Jews from the kingdom of Naples, lots of Jews went up to the Papal States and they really did dwelled around Civitanova and the, the southern part of the market. So our author came from there. Um, unfortunately, we don't know much about his family and about um, himself. We don't know how old he was when he wrote the Chronicle. Uh, we knew that he was um, he was married and his wife was Stella because we I found many records um, with the name of his wife. Um, we know that he, I don't know if he had children. Uh, we we do know that his brother had a child, had a daughter who was called Honorata. Uh, we don't know 
how old it was. Uh, in, in the Chronicle, he wrote that both him and, and um, so this is uh, some pictures of Civitanova Market, just to give you uh, a, a hint of what the city looked like or look, looks like today. Um, as I said, we don't know about the age. We know that um, in the Chronicle, he wrote that both him um, and his brother were uh, young. So they say, that he said, just said that they were among the youngers, but we don't know exactly how old they were. Um, okay. We also, um, unfortunately, we also don't know about um, his education and what kind of readings he, he I mean, what kind of readings he read and he held and if he had a library. Um, from a first glimpse at this, at this account, it is clear that he was a man who was deeply influenced by a religious environment. And it makes many references to biblical texts, particularly the Psalms, but also to the books of Exodus, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and others biblical texts. And it may be possible that he was also aware of other works belonging to the genre of the Shalcheleta Kabbalah, the chain of tradition, and other contemporary Hebrew chronicles, such as the Divreya Amim Le Malchait Sarfatu Beta Tumana Togar by Yosef Cohen, who was printed, which was printed for the first time in Sabioneta by Cornelius Adelkind in 1553-1554. So it, 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 there is a chance that he had this kind of books. Um, from a stylistic point of view, the work is characterized by a simple and spontaneous way of writing, which indirectly reflects his nature as a moneylender uh, and businessman living on the periphery of the Papal States in the 16th century, although he proves to be well-versed in Hebrew writings. Um, the work combines the Hebrew syntax and morphology of the sacred text with the addition of Judeo-Italian words throughout the chronicle. Now, the work um, is um, articulated in, um, into eight chapters, followed by an epilogue, the Khatima, and, and it presents the sequence of events that happened during Paul, during Paul the Fourth Pontificate from his election in May, 1550, May 1555 to his death in August 15, 1559, touching upon the first years of Pope Pius IV Pontificate. So Paul IV's successor. And general history is combined with the more personal story of the author who was arrested towards the end of the Paul IV's pontificate, along with other five Jews from Civitanova, and taken to Rome to be imprisoned and judged by the Roman Inquisition. Um, by the Roman Inquisition. So um, I think Zona was right when he described the chronicle into as a pyramidal structure. So the structure of the chronicle has a pyramidal structure in a, in a sense that the first part, the first four chapters, um, roughly, um, are more uh, focused on the general troubles of the Jews that happened during Paul IV's pontificate, starting from the Communis Absurdum, and then the establishment of the ghetto in Rome, and the persecution of the Jews um, in ma at many levels, and the burning of the stake of the Portuguese uh, conversos or Marranos in, uh, in Ancona in 1556, but also the wars of the Pope against uh, the Emperor Char uh, Charles V and his son Philip II. The second part of the chronicle is, on the contrary, entirely focused on the personal story of the author. So what happened to him, what happened to the, to the small community of Civitanova Marche, and to the arrest, um, so what, what happens, what led uh, the community of Civitanova to be under threat, and then um, six Jews were arrested and taken into chains to Rome. Um, so, um, yeah, I will talk about later the um, imprisonment and the jail of the Roman Inquisition at Ripetta, which then um, led to the uh, freedom of the Jews at the at the death uh, of the Pope at the Pope's death in August 1559. So, despite the chronicle, as I said, is a chronicle clearly from the title. It's a chronicle on the Pope Paul IV. Um, there are other mentions to other popes. So we have, for example, the mention of Paul III 
Alessandro Farnese, who was actually the mentor of Paul IV. And he was a very important pope uh, because he was also the pope who established the Roman Inquisition in 1542 with the Licet Ab Inizio, the bull that established the Roman Inquisition because of Paul IV. Um, so Paul IV was actually the cardinal the, that was, who was heading the, who was the head of the Roman Inquisition in 1542. And he was um, very, uh, I mean, Paul IV, the Cardinal Carafa, who then became Paul IV, was very attached to Paul III. That's why he also got the name after, after him. Um, but Paul III and Julius III, another Pope, Giovanni Maria Ciocchi del Monte, uh, were remember, are remembered in the Chronicle to have granted some special rights and privileges to the Jewish community, to the, to the Portuguese conversos in Ancona. So there were merchants who were baptized, um, forcefully, forcefully but baptized in Portugal in before 1490 or after 1496-97, uh, and then they moved to Italy um, because they they could have the freedom to return to the law of Moses. So and they they had some rights, um, special concessions from special grant, special agreements with the popes. Um, so these popes are remembered in this way. But um, when Paul IV became pope, uh, it's the first one of the first things he did is exactly to revoke all these concessions, all these um, special um, rights yeah, that the previous, the, the, the predecessors had given to the, to, the, to the Portuguese Jews, to the Portuguese conversos, not the Jews. So the conversos really that, um, as, as I will talk here really in a moment, um, the, the conversos were really one of the obsessions of Paul IV. So Julius III, uh, one of the popes I, I just mentioned, is remembered to, to have increased the number of the cardinals sitting in the committee of the Roman Inquisition. Um, and then we have some very curious um, uh, reference in the Chronicle, which is about Marcellus II. So the author um, stresses that the pope comes from the Marche, so from the region. Um, from his own region, um, and that he reigned for a very short time, which is indeed one of the shortest periods, one of just the shortest pontificates of, um, in the history of the Roman Church, um, because it was it reigned only for twenty three days. Um, and then um, he said something very very important. He said that though he reigned for only twenty three days, I quote, his name is well remembered because he performed a great salvation for Israel. Now this specific um, reference is very important because other people before me, like Anna Foa, Abraham David, uh, talk about. Um, an alleged blood libel that struck the Jewish community of Rome be before um, the election of Paul IV. And Marcellus II, so uh, this blood libel, according to this, to this legend, a Jewish, a, a Christian boy was found dead, crucified in the Campo Santo Teutonico, so in the German cemetery in the Vatican. And um, of course, the accusation fell on the Jewish community of Rome. So according to um, this reference, it is possible that the Pope intervened in favor of the Jews. So again, I don't, I don't have the time to enter in detail into that, um, but this is something that would, um, you know, um, counter, will make some, uh, it, it's very interesting. I think it's something we, I mean, scholars, historians need to work on um, to reconstruct what really happened because there are other scholars who say this is just pure fantasy, never happened. And I don't know, I think this reference is something that goes in the opposite direction. Um, and now we go finally to our Pope. So Paul IV who was born Gian Pietro Carafa from the kingdom of Naples, from a very important family, a noble family from uh, Naples, around Naples. And his, his pontificate was particularly harsh, both for Christians and Jews, but especially for Jews uh, dwelling in the, in the state of the church. Um, and to the extent that it is often considered to be one of the darkest pages in the history of Italian Jewry, 
after the Shoah. And even before his election, when he was still a cardinal, as I mentioned just before, I, he was very active in the establishment and the strengthening of the Roman Inquisition. And he was also the person behind the prohibition and the burning of the Talmud in 1553. And also later, he was the promoter uh, and of the creator of the first index of forbidden books, uh, the Index Librorum Prohibitorum, that was published in 1559. So he fought hard against every enemy of the church, both internal and external. And it is, this is why uh, when he became a pope with the name of Paul IV in 1555, he also targeted the Jews. So indeed, he became pope in, in May and on July the 14th um, of the same year, he issued the Comnimis Absurdum. So a bull that started with the words since it is absurd. What was really absurd for him was the coexistence of Jews and Christians together in the city of Rome. Um, so it was absurd for Jews to um, eat with Christians, to play, to meet and play cards. Um, it was absurd that Jews were called Mr. Master uh, with honorific titles. It was absurd that Jews had one um, one one more than one synagogue in the in the city. It was absurd that Jews um, were not, were living uh, without any restrictions and side by side with with the Christian. So um, with the issue of the Pope of the of the papal bull, the Comunimis absurdum, Paul the Fourth dramatically redefined the entire existence of the Jews um, in Rome and in the remainder of the state of the church. This set of laws not only ordered the establishment of those segregated areas that were co later called ghettos. So in this moment, we don't have the word ghetto, but these areas were called in, another, in other ways. Like for example, the chater, uh, or like the cloister, the cloister of the Jews, ristretto degli ebrei, but we don't have the word ghetto. So the word ghetto will come later in the, 70s of the 16th centuries, the 16th century. So um, the, the, the communist absurdum undermined the social, economic, cultural life of Jewish communities and their relations with the Christian society. Not only renewed, it renewed um, all canonical restrictions against the Jews, for example, the practice of medicine among Christians, the employment of, of Christian servants and maids, um, but also the pro it also pro forbade Jews to keep more than one synagogue in, in any city, restricted them to specific jobs, such as the trade of clothes and secondhand clothes and rags, and forced the wearing of the yellow hat or a distinctive sign, uh, the yellow hat for men and uh, a distinctive sign for women, and refused to permit a Jew to be addressed with honorific titles. So Benjamin writes about the application of the communist absurdum uh, between the center and the periphery of the papal states. And he especially focuses on the heartbreaking descriptions of the burning of the Portuguese conversos in 1556 in Ancona. Because when Paul IV, as I said, revoked all the privileges from the Portuguese conversos, he also did something else. He uh, considered these Jews not Jews. He considered the conversos as Christians because they received the baptism. And according to the Catholic Church, the sac all, all sacraments are valid ex opere operato. So it doesn't really matter how the, how the sacrament was uh, given to these people in Portugal. They, were con they had to be considered Catholics. So um, because they didn't want to, re did to reject the Jewish uh, law, um, they were considered heretics. So the, for, for this reason, Paul IV um, condemned all these Portuguese that didn't deny, didn't want to repent and go back to the Christian faith. He, um, he condemned to the stake. Um, so when I said it was very important, it is very important that strategic position of Civitanova near Ancona because Benjamin was often going to Ancona. And he well, was there. He was an eyewitness of the of the stake of these Portuguese conversos, 
and he gave us some beautiful um very painful very emotional um uh, but beautiful descriptions uh, of the speeches of this portuguese one 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 specific speech of one specific person who uh, addressed um who gave um who delivered a speech in front of the nation in front of the christian people of ancona before jumping in the fire so paul uh, so benjamin was there he heard he saw he was an eyewitness and he reported everything in the chronicle um again this is something i need to skip because we need to talk about the popes um so um so this is a very important page um and it's also what is very important, so when he talks about in the second part of the work, when he, he also tries to um, make sense of the application of the communis absurdum in the periphery of the papal states. So as we said, the bull was issued in July 1555, but the real problem started in the city, in the periphery of the, on the, periphery of the papal states much later. So the real problems for the Jews of Chivitanova started really quite late um but so benjamin gives um says that mostly because one uh one person was um so one 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 jew converted to christianity because um so we see this neophyte joan batista buonami she was born Aaron ben Menachem. and and we know that because uh, Many times when we have accusations against the Jews in early modern Italy, it's often because of a neophyte. So this happened, and so this conversion happened probably in 1558 because it claimed the exemption from taxes from the municipal council of Civitanova Marche. So this person started to make troubles uh, in the city and he tried to convert other Jews and he tried to take more um, people on his um, side and start a real fight with the, the Jewish people from the community of Civitanova. And this, of course, created lot, lots, of lots of problems for the community. Also, because in this time, the Communis Absurdum was to be um, applied, was applied in the, in the Civ in Civitanova market after three years, roughly. Um, so, I don't really talk about the whole story because it's very, the plot is very dense and I need to skip things. But um, so this neophyte was really in um, one of the people that created the problems. And so both him and another person, Achille da Montecchio was the treasurer, uh, the treasurer of the municipal council bound, bound together to, um, accused the Jews of several, uh, several accusations. For example, um, they had tried to, the, they said to the, to the, to the tribunal, to the, to the judge of Civitanova Market that the Jews had tried to convert a friar to uh, Judaism. And then they had given him some clothes to go to, to Eretz Israel. And then they tried, for example, to uh, to to throw to throw stones at some um, statues or some um, sacred images of some some sacred Christian uh, images. So we we don't know. Uh, I I don't really go into detail. But long story short, the Jews um, uh, were accused of this uh, of very I mean several several uh, several charges. And, and then the, the Roman Inquisition came to Civitanova. Um, so, because the, basically the head of the Inquisition was uh, the Cardinal Michele Ghislieri, who then became Pius V, Pope with the name of Pius V. He was very, it was very tired of these Jews. He was very tired of the, of the, the rumors coming from, Ancon, from Civitanova. So he decided to send horsemen to Civitanova to take the Jews and have a trial in Rome um, at the, in, the pre, at the, in the tribunal of the Roman Inquisition at Ripetta. So um, what I think, it, um, so the, the, again, we can, I can talk about hours probably about this because it's, um, 
it's it's an amazing description. So the description here, the author gives of the trip from Civitanova to uh, the Vatican. So here, here you have Civitanova del Vaticano, so the Vatican. It's an amazing description. We don't have any other sources from this time telling about um, the transfer of prisoners um, in such a long distance in a very short time. Or by, um, I mean, they, they both walked and rode horses to get to, um, to Rome. Uh, but it's, it's really an amazing description about how the Roman Inquisition functioned. And this is also very important because we don't have any documents about this. Also because in 1559, after the death of Paul IV, uh, the Roman people destroyed everything. So we don't have the archive. The archive, the archives of the Inquisition went burned, were totally lost, with the exception of two volumes from 1559. So I think that this, the, the chronicle of Pope Paul IV by Benjamin Ben Nehemiah Ben Al Natan is, a, is an extraordinary source, because also because of that. Um, so we have an idea of how um, how long did it take, how long it took to to go from Civitanova to Rome and how, what people, uh, what Jews uh, ate because they were looking for, they needed uh, kosher food and they needed to sleep and they needed to pray. And we have all the descriptions of prayers associated with Jewish holidays and Yom Kippur. So it's really an amazing, um, no, it's not Yom Kippur, it was Tisha B'Av. So it's really an amazing description, uh, which unfortunately I need to skip. Um, so Benjamin was aware of many things um, because it was an eyewitness, because probably he had access to um, the accounts or uh, rumors of um, other people who were next to him. Um, and also because he read, he was probably, he probably had access to, um, to, to books. So, for example, this is something, um, so I, I, want, I, I go very shortly. Um, so Benjamin and the Jews were in the, in the prison for a month, roughly. Uh, in this prison, in the prison, they also, so he, they met other people, both prison, other prisoners were historical prisoner because we have information about these prisoners. Um, they met guardians, of course, they met a lawyer, they met the judge. Um, so people really existed. Um, then he talks about, for example, what kind of food, kosher food, not kosher food that was in the prison. Uh, what kind of, um, what was the daily routine of prisoners in the, in the prison? So it's really, again, an amazing account. Um, then in 1559, the rumors of the death of the Pope, who was very old, very sick, um, came to the prison, came to the ears, to the ears of the of the prisoners, and it was custom after the death of the at the death of the Pope, the Roman people usually uh, released all the prisoners from the prison, and they set fire to uh, whatever they found on their way, and. And they also destroy many times destroy the, the the statues of the popes. So this, of course, happened especially when the pope was particularly harsh uh, and was particularly hated by the Roman people. So this is the case. Also, um, it, it's an it's a it's a very short description, but very um, it, it's, it it tells a lot because it tells a lot about the degree of knowledge that a Jewish person could have in the 16th century. So here in the description says, because he was released from the prison, so you know he could go around Rome and see what was happening during the days, I mean, during after a, the 18th of August, 1559. So he said, uh, there were lit torches next to his head and feet and two men who had been his servants guarding his carcass, really not his corpse, his carcass. However, they did not honor his death in accordance with the law as they had done for other popes. When people came to kiss their feet for three days in a row and watched over them there all day and night and then buried them with a great honor with a funerale superbissimo. So this Italian, this superb funeral is really Judeo-Italian, so Italian in Hebrew characters. 
But what happened? They didn't do so for this impure, hurted, dead dog called the fourth, because the people wanted to throw his carcass in the Tiber River. And for this reason, his relatives secretly buried him after Shabbat and ended in the dark hours of the night, lest the people delay them. Um, and this is very, um, again, very meaningful, um, also because I think he really saw um, the, the corpse, or I mean, not, not closely, but uh, he said that he was in the, in the St. Peter's Square and he, and he could see the, the, the corpse of the Pope. I think it, it, it's, it's a reliable account. And also it is true that the court of the Pope buried the Pope in secret at night because it was a real fear and a real danger that the Roman people would have thrown the corpse of the Pope in the river. Um, then it was buried in secret in the Vatican. And after a few years, um, his, uh, the, his rest, uh, his remains were uh, transferred to the Basilica of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, which you can see here is the chapel, the the the, 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 the the Carafa Chapel and the, and the Basilica in the church. Okay, so another thing that uh, it's really, he knew a lot. I really think he knew a lot about um, the customs of the church, the customs of the Inquisition, because it was a prisoner of the Inquisition, the customs of the funeral, because probably someone told him how, uh, what was, what was the real, um, the usual uh, usual custom uh, for a funeral of the pope and and then we have this a new this this information about the conclave so the conclave is the election of the pope uh, basically when all the cardinals as in his own words um the cardinals came to rome from all the places where they resided and gathered in a council called the conclave in their language and again here it's a judeo italian so Italian and Hebrew characters. Here you have my translation in my book. And so the cardinals came in order to elect another pope above them when an agreement had been reached between them. They were there for many days because they did not unanimously agree. They were divided into three groups and each group selected a candidate. And he's talking about a very difficult and a very long conclave which um, then brought the election of Pius IV. So the conclave of Pi the, the, the electing, uh, the, the, the conclave electing Giovanni Angelo Medici, so Pius IV was one of the longest, I think the third or the first longest one in the history of the Roman church. So finally on the day, on Christmas day, Pius IV is elected Pope. And, and it is very important because this Pope is acclaimed as almost as a saint by the Jews. And so that, for example, he says that uh, this Pius IV is pious in his, uh, it is real, is a real, a real pious man and is merciful. And he is a patron, is a patron, is a father. And he, um, all the people, he said, rejoice at his pontificate because he declared that he would restore mercy to all the people of the country and allow them to rest from the heavy travails that had been suffering and console them of the sorrow and troubles and troubles that Paul the Fourth had caused them. And then he, the thing is that he really wanted. So he, the, the the thing he says that the Jews really hoped that Paul the that Pius the Fourth would abolish the cumnimis absurdum, which never happened, but. Um, he said, for example, that Pius IV gave the Jews the permission to wear black hats in the streets, and not the yellow hat that was uh, the imposition of the Communis Absurdum. Um, and in this way, it was a compassionate man. Um, then I think he, fi he finished to write the Chronicle because of that, because this is really the last, before the Khatima, this is really the last part, um, the, story, the last historical event he talks about. So the pontificate of Pius IV, uh, Pius IV. And I think that the, the narration ends in 1562 because it does, doesn't mention another decree from, from later years. So um, 
what to say um we have a we don't have a real um mention of uh pius v because of course the the chronicle ends with the pontificate of pius the fourth but a great deal of descriptions in the in the in the chronicle are about the cardinal antonio ghislieri michele ghislieri uh who was also known as the cardinal alessandrino and was also known later with the name of with the with the with the name of pius v and pius v was very um Arch pop. It was really a creature of Paul IV, and he was really hostile to the Jews, to the to the to the extent that he expelled all the Jews uh, from the state of the Church, with the exception of Rome, Ancona, and Avignon. So, you know, I, I think it, Benjamin didn't know that because I don't know. We don't know if he died before or he, he moved somewhere else, or he moved to the Ottoman Empire. We don't know where he ended up to after he returned to Civitanova, after the, the Pope's death. But he he would have wrote a very interesting story also about Pius V, I think. So to conclude, um, so in the Chronicle, Benjamin gives um, descriptions of, Pi of Paul IV as we said, for, we saw, for example, as a dog, a, an impure hearted evil dog. Um, some of the times he described him as a evil, as a resha. Some of the times as a devil, Belial, and other time as Amalek. And Amalek was really an important figure because it was the first enemy of the Jews that the Israelites found on their, on their way after the 40 year track in the desert um, at Refidim. So um, in, the, in the Chronicle, you also talk about uh, his nephew. So Cardinal, uh, the Cardinal Carafa, uh, Carlo Carafa, who is often mentioned in the Chronicle with the name of Aman. So, um, so the evil, uh, the evil of person in the story of, uh, of Purim, um, so in other, in other, also in other places, in other passages, we have other references to the king, to the pope, and his nephew as uh, the pharaoh. So you know there are many things that have returns, uh, many many recurring themes and um, titles and courses in the chronicle. So for example, so the Jewish formula imach shmo may his memory be blotted out. Or Imach Shemove Zichro, the Zichrono, may his name and his memory be blotted out. Now, this oblivion, this Namnatio Memorie of the Pope was not just uh, a metaphorical one, but it was also a real one. Because after the death of the Pope, the Municipal Council of Rome ordered the destruction of the statue of the Pope that was realized by Vincenzo de Rossi and was placed on the Capitol Hill in Rome. And then he ordered also the, the destruction of all the erase, the, the erasure and destruction of all the coat of arms of the family Carafa and the coat of arms of Paul IV. So we have um, a real physical, physical annihilation of, of, the, of the memory of the Pope. Um, but I want to, I, I jump to the conclusion. Um, so the Chronicle of Benjamin is uh, clearly a remarkable and unique source. And as far as I know, no other works have been dedicated to the figure or the pontificate of a single Pope. Although Benjamin follows the most recording themes of medieval and early modern Jewish historiography, for example, the um, messianic expectations in the Khatima or the um, uh, explanation of the current um, uh, bad situation of the Jews as a result of the of Israel's sins. Uh, we also have the, I mean, the final portrait that the Chronicle gives is allows us to see the light and not just the destruction and the annihilation and persecution. And I think that, in a way, it really, um, it really goes beyond the lacrimos, what Salo Baron called the lacrimos conception of Jewish history, because the story of Benjamin is, in the end, a story that ends well. 
So, and, and it's also a story that um, tells us that the writing of history is perceived as a moral commandment. And again, here we have another reference to the to Exodus and to the Deuteronomy. And Benjamin writes in the chron throughout the chronicle that it really felt a moral commandment to write um, to write a memorial of the things as he saw without any additions or defects. If on the one hand, Benjamin put all, he have, all his efforts into remembering what happened to the Jews, on the other, he worked to annihilate the Pope and his family, repeatedly coursing them, coursing them with Jewish formulas such as may his, name, may his name be blotted out and it's why may his name and memory blotted, be blotted out. And, and we saw that was not a metaphorical one. I think Zona was right when he included uh, Benjamin's chronicle in the tradition of the local Purims because there are indeed many references to Purim, Aman, and other evil um, characters uh, against the Jews, uh, slanderers of the Jews. Um, and also in, in, in the local Purims are recounted the hardships of, and the following miraculous salvations, uh, which befell certain Jewish communities, families, or individuals. Like the scroll of Esther, the chronicle of Pope Paul IV narrates the miraculous salvation of the Jewish people from the evil plots of their enemies, Paul IV, who are ultimately defeated, but unlike them, the work is characterized by an impartial and precise account of events not closely related to Jewish history, which makes the text a reliable historical source. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to turn over the table to Estera to, to, to conclude for us. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, the next uh, talk that will be coming up. So it's um, by Professor James McGrath on the Mendeans, a minority on the move and their manuscripts. So Professor McGrath is the Clarence Goodwin Chair in the New Testament Language and Literature at the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Butler University. He'll talk to us about the Mendeans, which are the last surviving Gnostic group um, to make it from ancient times. His talk will discuss their identity, religious practices, and focus in particular on their manuscript tradition, which is preserved in Oxford. Beyond the 18th of May um, at 6 p.m. British Standard Time, that's 1 p.m. East Coast U.S. time. So um, thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you, Martina, for the amazing talk. Thank you very much. Thank you all.